and also has a very the book has also like a very gentle introduction uh, you know to software how do you install it and how do you set it up and um, and so I'm a, I'm a this a bit a triangle person so you see I, I use R on top of uh, other software um, and you see I, I made this package plot KML so I can I can do this I can get the data in in, uh, in uh, Google Earth you guys do you use Google Earth as a GS do you use it as a GS? Is it new? I use it yeah. sometimes. But as a GS, so that you can put your own layers and you know that you can uh, visualize something. Uh, yeah. The other, the other option is if I go back to this, uh, uh, this thing. Um, so I made this uh, map here. Uh, this one. The, let me see. So here I made a prediction. Uh, zinc, I don't know, this is zinc predicted. Uh, and I can also write it uh, in, uh, I can use write GDAO. So I, I write the predictions. And I think the first map is the prediction. And I write it to, let's say, zinc AML. So I can make a TIFF, right? Uh, so I can write it. Uh, let me just see what's my directory. Uh, D temp, yeah, so I can put it here. So now I wrote that in this temp directory and I can also, QGIS also very important software. Uh, so I, if I look at this temp, uh, so let's say temp folder. TMP and the last one I made this one. Oh, I didn't make it a TIFF. Oh no, actually I, I don't see the extension. So, so if I drop it here, so now you can see uh, this map will appear here. And so I can zoom in, zoom out, I don't know. Uh, but what's interesting is that I can add this uh, um, background map. So let's say we are the satellite. Um, and so now we can see that layer and I can also customize the color. So I can say it's a, um, let's see, I'm gonna like this turbo um, and put to optimize the viewing. No, it's apply. So, so now it's a similar, it's a similar as we see in, uh, in uh, Google Earth. So more or less similar. Um, but uh, I can also uh, play with transparency. Well, there's all these tools in QGIS. So here's the transparency tool. So I can make it uh, transparent, you see. So I can play with that. I can see how the values change. So let's say I keep it like this. And uh, there's the value tool. Value tool is very nice because I can, I can see, uh, I can go over the pixel. I can see exactly the value. Yeah, so I can see exactly the value and that allows me to, uh, you know, it's like I'm almost like every pixel I can see. Okay, this is the pixel. This is the pixel. Um, so that's kind of nice, right, to be able to uh, to do that. Uh, if you want to play uh, even further, uh, I could also do something like this. Um, so let me see the... So I put the same layer. It's called grid to poly. And uh, I can plot that. Uh, so plot KML. And so what you see here now, it's a bit, it's funny, but I see every polygon. Let me turn this off. I can see every polygon, the values. This is what not very efficient because it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to read, but I can see every, this is the center of polygon and I can actually see, see values, right? And uh, and these are the as I said these are the actual so they are not they are not uh, rasters anymore these are actual polygons so you can see the size of the pixel how much does it matches in the nature 
how it, does it relate you know so you can uh, you can do a lot of stuff basically with this uh, uh, with this functionality you know so uh, so it allows you to really understand geographical data and and every time you make a new map you visualize it and so uh, so i don't know how many of you are familiar with qgs i mean how much do i have to explain um there's also our package our qgs you can call from R, you can call QGIS and functionality. And so, um, so this integration today of the software, uh, it's, uh, it's quite smooth. And I, I'm so happy I contributed to the GDAL, I contributed to PlotKML. And um, so I'm, I'm happy that these uh, links now, they're quite strong and yeah, I call it. And where does it come from? So, uh, well, you can only find that one way, it's to, to put a question. And, and then it will show you, okay, the data comes somewhere from here, from the SP package. Yeah, so that, that's where the data is. And so now I will have to go to my, uh, I have to go somewhere here. Um, and I think I have to go to my, um, yeah, no, I'm not sure. Under, under Windows, it's a bit more complicated. Is it after my documents are? So then I find SP and there's the data. And so here's the data, right? So I could also load the data. I could load it from this uh, URL, you know, it's possible also. I know from URL from the, but the data is here. So that's the answer. Yes. And uh, yeah. So I, I don't, I just don't see here it. I hate this. Oh, yeah. Here's the type. And uh, let me see the size. Yeah, here's the size. So this it's quite small. It's a small data. There's mm -hmm. the the uh, there's the it's a, yeah. They just make this simple little data set, and you just load it by doing the demo, demo without echo, and then it loads automatically. Let me uh, do this. Uh, clear workspace. So you see now it's empty, and if I do this then it will load uh, all this data set. So I don't, it's just a, yeah, very, it's a very quick way to get the points and the grids. Um, okay, any other question? Uh, how do people say that they use uh, a lot of uh, cages? Uh, everybody okay. use, I think. Oh okay, yeah, great, great. So you, you know this, uh, uh, I don't have time to explain you, but how to get the satellite image and how to get these uh, plugins, you know, I have a seed, I have lots of plugins. There's a, yeah. there's a, yeah, there's a plugins you can, you can draw the street view, I think somewhere, let me see this one. Uh, so I can put maybe a street view here, so we can even like walk. I think we should be, ah, this now, is, it's not working, maybe some connection. Uh, but uh, maybe this one, if I do this one. So, so now I can get exactly on the farm. So that's the, that's the actual farm, that's the place. I'm not just looking, I'm looking from the ground, you know? So mm -hmm. here, I, here I'm, I'm looking from above. This is these trees and here I can, oops. And here I'm looking, I'm looking at these trees here. I think, yeah, this one, this is the patch I look from. So that's the same patch. So I can even look, you know, approximately, you can even see the soil. If I come here, I can, I can see the soil, you know, right? So, um, so this way you can integrate uh, uh, looking from above and looking from below. No, I'm actually, I, I went here. I went here, sorry. Um, I was uh, here looking at this, this little patch. And now yes. I'm just looking, <coughs> just looking from, uh, from, from the side. Very cool, this interface with Google View. Nice. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, if you, uh, today, I mean, if you uh, want to really look, uh, the whole world is now available in submeter accuracy, well, thanks to these big corporations. But, uh, uh, so you can, uh, you can see actually, I may be in tropics and some forests, you don't see much, but in Europe, you know, it's all, it's all there. And uh, interestingly enough, the, if you look at the open street map data, uh, so so this uh, this place is somewhere here. 
let me see if I, yeah this is the place is the same place if you look at the open street map data so we look at the same thing actually it, uh, sometimes it has even more detail like uh for example what's really nice in open street map you can see the homes you can see the homes and if you go to google uh so if i uh, uh leave this uh, you won't see the you you see you don't see the homes the the buildings i mean they are they are visible but not the numbers not the numbers and here you can see the numbers so and this data is public you can download it this is this is data digitized by people but in netherlands there are people are very uh, they do a lot of work they work so they, they digitize all country and everything you know people going digitized so um, so but what we can do now we map that uh, we map that uh, zinc concentration and uh, and we mapped it using a uh, so we mapped it using this uh, land map, right? We, uh, we fitted the model and, uh, and that's kind of uh, a kind of, now it's easy for you. I mean, you can do predictive soil mapping with this train SP learner. Um, and I can look a bit uh, in that function and uh, you can see, you can uh, change the, uh, the um, basically you can change the methods you use you can do uh, binomial variables. You can do classification. You can do regression. Um, so it's a, it's a quite uh, ca quite comprehensive. Um, but I could play with this. Uh, I could play with the uh, with the learners. I could uh, extend the learners. So let's see if I put something else. I'll just call it LS. So this is the default one. But I could put something else. Um, let me see uh, XG boost. Right, I put something else. And then here I just have to say that I use a different libraries. So I put it here. Right, now it goes in, it fits uh, four, uh, four learners, uh, but also uses the XGBoost, as you can see here. And um, let's take a look if this helps. So, uh, so if I look at it, yeah, the uh, XG boost not important. It doesn't come up. So it's only yeah. the N, N net and Ranger. So, you know, if I now take, if I can take, for example, this one, I just take it out. I said, well, it's not, neither of the two, they come. Maybe I can put Cubist. Let's see what happens then, Cubist. And then I ret retrain it. And Cubis is a bit slower. Uh, let's take a look now. Uh, now it's still it's still just the random forest, but the the Cubis and and net they they come still. I mean, uh, it's a bit actually strange. This one has a very high uh, coefficient. It has a very high coefficient, but it has a very small uh, significance. But anyway, mm -hmm. it looks like looks like this variable. I mean, you can. It's really just the ranger. So, uh, so you could also just use the ranger, um, but anyway, that's the that's the option. So you have to you have to do a bit of uh, a step by step, and uh, and then also what is uh, what you can do. Let me see if I do like this. I'll take the cubist out and I put this XG boost. So now I have these three models and I, I trained the learner. And then what I will do, I can also tune. So I make a super version of that learner. Tune SP learner. Right, so first I made the first model. Let's look at this. I made the first model and now I make a second model out of the first model where I also tune parameters. Now let's see. Mm -hmm. Now it's a bit more computational because now it uh, tries to find the uh, uh, tries to find the best parameters. Let's see. Ah, oh, I have to um, update. Uh, just a second. I need to update. Um, I think I had a bit. Oh, no, it's up to date. So what did they do? Mm. 
what the example let me see this is the actually boost da, da, da. only only to ask you tom this is an ensemble machine learning we oui? yes yes this is ensemble yes. that's what i will talk now first okay. and then we will switch to the space time so mm -hmm. i do ah yes yeah, sorry i have to do like this yeah sorry so um so i make a super version of this one Oh, silent. So here's a super version of the, because this one will uh, optimize the parameters and also it will so optimize uh, random forest parameters and also we do feature selection. And so let's take a look. And so uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really differ, right? I don't see a difference. So the, yeah, fine tuning doesn't help. Looks like it does. Well, it's even it's even gets it. Uh, looks like it's almost even a bit worse. The uh, the ask the um, residual standard error. It's uh, it's about the same. So yeah. even gets worse. Even gets worse. Yeah, interesting. Uh, because this is a small data set, you know, so you don't get effects of uh, fine tuning. I think. So, but, but this is the way you can do, you can uh, make the uh, learner and then also fine tune it. And then you can do the prediction, right? Uh, so in this case, I will still use this one to do prediction. And uh, yeah, so that's the, solution. so I want to talk about that, the mach ensemble machine learning. And I have this nice tutorial. So that's the, the first hour we'll do. Uh, this, is the, this is the tutorial. And uh, let me send you that. Put in the chat. Yes, I will send it in the chat. Um, this is the tutorial. And uh, so that's uh, something I want to now run with you. I want to explain you that and you can ask me questions and we can go step by step. And I will, I will also run it in the code. Um, if, you, if you want to run it on your own machine, you have to install this. So you have to install like a Git Kraken or uh, I'm not sure if the, this is the, the GitHub desktop, but I'm not sure if I can clone, let me see clone repository. Because this one, I, they are competing companies, you know, so I don't know if they will, if this will work, but if I put this one, let me see. Maybe it will work. Oh yeah, it works. Okay, it works, great. So you can, uh, you can clone the repo uh, and once you clone it, then you get the local copy. It's a bit, it's a bit big. So it's uh, looks like, oh, hundred megabytes. What did I put here? I wasn't very careful. I think I produced, I produced a lot of things here and maybe one of the files is a bit bigger, but I'm surprised actually it's a hundred megabytes. Let me see. I'm surprised it's 100 megabytes. Something, something's wrong. I shouldn't have these ones. Sometimes the, the, you don't see the size. Yeah, these are all small data. So I don't know why would it be 100 megabytes, but it uh, doesn't matter. So you can clone it. And once you clone it, then you get it, you get it locally. Um, so, um, so I could open that in a showing Explorer. So here's this, uh, this thing, it's now here. And I can open the, I can open this one, right? I can open with, uh, with R Studio. if I just click. And then off I go, I get it like this. Yes, and now I open the, the README and you see special interpolation prediction using ensemble machine learning. Um, so that's the, the markdown and markdown. If you have the version of our studio, uh, which is the, let me see about, so version, um, build 372, but what's the version? I don't see 2021.091. So I, I think I used the most recent one. Yes, right? I think it is. Yeah, and then if you use that version, then you can click here and it creates it like a, 
like a this Python Jupiter or Jupiter, how is it called? Uh, the notebooks in Python's you have, but it takes a bit of time. I don't know why it takes so much time. That's not nice, but uh, it renders it into a something that is uh, readable, something like this. And so now it's like a text you can you can read. Nice. Yeah. So you can you can read about this uh, uh, ensemble machine learning, and in parallel you can run the code. So, so that's a, that's an option. And and so what you see here the so what is the ensemble machine learning? Ensemble machine learning is machine learning where you have uh, multiple independent learners, and then you use the power of multiple learners combined. Um, and it's very common in it started I think in. Uh, they used it a lot in climate science at the beginning. And then later on also it took off in machine learning. And, but it comes actually from statistics. It's statistical techniques. And in principle, they said that three ways to do ensemble machine learning is the bagging, boosting and stacking. Uh, and we are, we are interested in stacking. We are primarily interested in this one. And how does this stacking works? Well, it, imagine you, you fit multiple models independently, and then you fit so-called meta model, this one, uh, which predicts uh, which predicts the values from the individual models. Um, and so, so how it looks like, um, in essence, you, for example, here if you look at the formula, uh, the super model looks something like this. Um, let me see. Yeah, he, model looks like this. So the zinc concentration is a function of uh, results of uh, random forest, results of XGBoost, results of N net, and then and two uh, two more. So in this case, I have one, two, three, four, five. So I, I fit a meta learner which uh, uh, correlates this target variable to these five learners. Uh, and uh, and then you can do that with the land map. You do it in a in a few lines, and so. Uh, so if I go if I go here, that's the stuff I was showing you. I can maybe switch. Uh, I was using zinc, but let me do a, a lead. Lead. So I will do lead, and uh, and I can now run it here. Up to this up to this point, I can run everything before. So this one will install the packages and everything, and uh, and then I go and it will run all the way up to here. So I just change it. I put a lead instead of uh, instead of using the zinc. Okay. And now I got this model, and then I say, okay, show me the results. And so here we see that for the for lead uh, adjusted dark square is zero point fifty eight, uh, and you see that the n net again ranger and n net they come they come uh, as a, as a most important. But I could also put I could go back and I say this stuff I can all uh, turn off. I don't need this code. I can say I'm not led. I want I'm interested in organic matter. Yes. So I, I do the organic matter and then I just rerun everything up to here again. And so now I make a map of organic matter. Can I, can I ask you, Tom? Yes. Uh, yes. When you use a machine learning and you see the answers like this one, uh, do you think that we have to exclude the models that are not in um, correlated? Uh, yeah, they're not in, yeah, are not correlated. Yeah. Use only the, the others. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. In uh, you know, in principle, if you look at the uh, the MLR. By the way, this uh, land map uses MLR. I, you, I build everything on top of MLR. So if you look at the MLR uh, learners, uh, you can see that there's like uh, 59 of them. So there are 59 regression methods and you could always do and say, okay, I want 59 always, right? You could always put 59 mm -hmm. and then you take ensemble out of 59, but <laughs> it's very <laughs> complicated. <laughs> ah, you suffocate, you suffocate, you, you know, you run out of RAM, you run out of, you will be just computing and, and, and many techniques they kept for like legacy, you know, many techniques they're here for legacy. Uh, so I don't think, I don't think you need them, you know, and, uh, and then some techniques are very computational. So, and they need some extra input and things. 
So, uh, so what we come, we come up to these uh, few techniques that we think that are important. Um, so this, I was here, Andy. Uh, so we think they're important. And so we come to these techniques and then we, uh, we test that uh, we use uh, some of these like a five or six techniques. And then we stick to that basically. Uh, and then if you see that some model, if you have like a five methods and you say, well, these two like very low significance. So, you know, they get a very low weight, you know, so they, their weight is so small that they actually, they have no impact, you know, they eventually they have very little impact. So you don't have to even manually remove them. You don't have to remove them. They are like, the impact is close to zero, right? So, um, so, so that's why you don't have to do much because it's this T value, actually this T value, that's what counts. So the, the, the higher the T value, in this case, funnily enough, the T values are like relatively high, but you still, you still don't get it. They're not significant. Then they don't seem to be this uh, regression coefficients. They don't see to be significant. Um, but, uh, but it's nice to see that the, you know, it's, you can fit up to 64%. Uh, and then the other thing, which is interesting, that's what I want to show you now. I cannot hear, I can say muse. Um, and I, I, I make a log or I make a new variable, right? And I call it log, a log one P. Um, so I make a new variable, which, which is now a log, mm -hmm. right? And then I change to log. Because uh, uh, I will I will explain you that, but what's very interesting now I don't need this lambda one because there's no transformation needed. I did a transformation myself, yes, and now I can uh, train again. Uh, so now I'm I'm not doing the uh, original but the log, and maybe for I did I did the organic method. It's not very skewed. Let me do let me do something else. Sorry, I'll do something. I'll do the zinc because zinc is very skewed. If I look at the zinc, so this is zinc, uh, and let me see the histogram. <coughs> so here's the Zinc, you see, zinc is very skewed. It's highly skewed. Most of the values are small, right? And so, so it's a kind of, you go like, okay, well, if I do machine learning, then uh, machine learning will be controlled a lot with these higher values. And maybe you're interested in, you know, you're more interested in actually the way you have a less, less zinc. Now, this depends, I mean, what your really interest is. But let's say if you're interested to uh, know a better, bit less where's the like uh, not not so much where you have a high zinc but where you have like a most of zinc and also if you know that you some of the learners are like linear learners so once you do the long transformation you can do some linear learner uh, and, and so when i train now long log zinc and that's something which, which is now very interesting to see um, i can train this uh, log of the zinc and remember, I will uh, maybe I can uh, give it a different. Uh, uh, I will give it di different code. So I will call this uh, ML, right? And this one I will call M zero or something, or M zero. Yeah. So I train both. And uh, so when I train the both, let let's see now what happens. What is the difference? Um, you, you've trained both with log zinc. Is that supposed to be like that? Ah, uh, sorry. Yes, no. You're right. Who who said that? This is a good student. Me, <laughs> Kayo. <laughs> and here I have to say this. Uh, what was the? Let me see. I have to put this again. The lambda is a one. Lambda is one. This is the means. It means it's a log normal uh, variable. So, so this is the correct one. So, well spotted. 
So I just have to rerun this M0. And then if I uh, turn this off, now we can see the difference. So here's the, the uh, M0. And uh, let's see, what do we get? So we get only a uh, ranger, right? We only get the random forest and we have the R square is uh, 0 0.67. Uh, random forest and then uh, let's see ml so i'll put a new uh, let me see i have to do like this ah now it's a complicated how do i put in this thing i want to put it separately so i don't then mess up things So here was this one. And I put this one here, ML. So we can compare now. So this one, you see, it has a better R square, 0 0.76. And it has the, it has, a, it's like a two learners uh, significant. And this one is a bit uh, less R square. So I think Valdir says, oh, I like the other one. You, you improve the R square, but R <laughs> square is a, yeah, R square is a, le a relative measure. You know, it's not, it's a people that don't understand. R square is in a, you know, it's a relative measure. So any, any skewed variable, any skewed variable, if you do in a log space or in the original space, always the R square is higher in log space. It doesn't mean you have a, you have a high accuracy, you know, it's just in a log space, the R square is a bit, because it, uh, you adjust for these high values. The high values become smaller. And, um, and then you, the difference, the, uh, the, uh, the absolute difference gets smaller. As the absolute difference gets smaller, you get a smaller R square. So it's just a one trick to boost uh, R square, but it doesn't mean it's more accurate. But nevertheless, what you see is that, uh, that you get two learners. So that's what I want to show. You get two learners instead of only one. Uh, and this one also has only two stars. And now we have, this is a bit more distinct. So, yes. so, and, and that's one of the reasons is because we, you see, we use a, a linear model. This is just a GLM to make the, the meta learner is a linear model, right? And, um, and so then this linear model, uh, it's a bit easier to model um, <coughs> if you use an a log, log. And I explained that in the, in the tutorial, if you look at the tutorial, you, see, you can see the difference between um, the difference between using the, uh, uh, so this is the log transform variable and you can even, you can plot even next to each other distributions uh, of the predicted and observed in the log space and in the original space. So this one is the observed histogram and this one is the predicted uh, in this predicted in log space and that bank transform. And what you see here is that the original gets a bit smoothed out. You see, you smooth it out. So these high values, they get cut off. They get cut off somewhere here. And then also the low values also get a bit smoothed. But, but you can see that this, uh, and because regression explains only about 70%, uh, there is some smoothing effect. There is a smoothing effect. So you have to be, you have to be careful with that. Um, and then the other thing we can do is uh, we can plot these accuracy plots and uh, we can see uh, you know, if there's any individual points that uh, make problems. Um, so this is, uh, this is ensemble machine learning. And as you see in this tutorial, I'll explain different uh, aspects of the machine learning. Uh, and then also I can show how you can use it for, uh, for example, for classification problems. Uh, so let's go to that one also. This was the, the one I was running before. Um, I had I have two copies. I have to close one. So I, uh, don't see. So I can I can run this classification also. So I use another data set, the Ebergotsen data set. And, uh, and it's uh, yeah, surprisingly you uh, you take this uh, soil type, for example. You see, there's a soil type. 
Uh, and this is a German classification system, so don't ask me, but Boden, Boden means soil in German. I don't know if you know, but they also have the Kolubi soil. Sol, sol is a Latin, I think, or something, Solum. Yes. And in German, it's Boden. Boden, and so they have this uh, uh, one, two, three, four, so, uh, so about uh, 13 soil types, and they have some points, they don't know what's the soil type, but you see there's a, it's a nice distribution, but there are some soil types, they only have one, they only have a one point. Oh, not nice. So I wouldn't, I would just take out these points. I don't know if I do it. Uh, now I don't do it, but uh, I will just take it out. And then I said, I want to use these three methods, the XGBoost, uh, neural networks and Ranger. And I run the, I, uh, I uh, take the covariates here and I run the, uh, I train the model. And now, um, you know, it's a more points, it's like almost uh, two and a half thousand points instead in, in comparison to, uh, to the mass data set. So it takes a bit of time, be careful. <clears throat> And because uh, machine learning is very computational, right? It's it's no joke. It's uh, um, and I can see that uh, if everything is correct, then I'm running it in parallel. Maybe not. It's uh, running. Maybe I said uh, don't run it in parallel. But it takes a bit of time, you see. And so I can run that uh, uh, predictions. And again, I will say uh, predict. Once it's done. Oh yes, in this example, I I literally run with all data, and in the package. If you go to the package, uh, then I subset the data so it's faster. I subset to something like, uh, I don't know, 20% or something. Classification, yeah, here I subset. Um, but uh, if you run the uh, prediction of soil types, oh yeah, it's still, it's still uh, running, let me see. Maybe I didn't, uh, maybe I didn't put the parallel. No, parallel is false, oh, my mistake. Need to stop it. Session interrupt. Okay, let's do it one more time. I'll do it like this. So let's try now. So now we run it in parallel with 12 CPUs. And you see now, uh, but it will go 12 times faster. Mm -hmm. I can also see it here, let me see. Network, no, this CPU. No. Yeah, you see all the CPUs, they're running full capacity. Yes. And so it should be much faster to, I left it uh, computing the whole thing. And uh, let me see, how do I do it here? We, do I use the whole Ebergots and data set coordinates? Oh uh, yeah, I do a subset here. But anyway, here's the model. So I get the model mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it's the same thing. I can do the summary. I can see the summary of the model and I can make a prediction. So let's see the prediction. So, so here I, can, I made a map and, and here's the accuracy of the model. I can make just this uh, classification accuracy. Um, it just, I print it. Uh, so that's the difference between observed and predicted. So you see, I have the, the first one, I have 34, uh, so 34 predicted and other ones are also predicted, but wrongly. And, uh, and total number it's, uh, so there are 14 in error, yeah. 14 in error and 34 are correct. It's not so bad, right? The other, the other one is six brown air there. You see this one, brown air there. So I had six, 617, yes. And uh, I only get uh, like a 30. 30 negatively predicted. So it's a quite high accuracy. No, so actually it's 53, 53, but it's a, it's a okay accuracy, you know? So I, I got 620 correctly uh, and we can uh, plot that. Uh, we can plot that like this. We make a plot. 
And this is now the soil type map, right? It's a soil type map. But uh, what's very interesting also to uh, uh, plot that into, let me see, I will uh, make a code. I will put that into uh, a QGS. Uh, so that's the, let me see predictions are here. Let's say we, we wanted the second one on, let me see. Now. Yeah, these are the names. So we want the second one, let's say probability. And we'll call it uh, I'll call it the same name, uh, just the put a tiff, yeah? Mm -hmm. <coughs> then let's take a look in QGS. Let's see the map we made. Uh, so here. You know, with the... The name is a prob. Ah, sorry. I know, but I put it in a wrong directory. I uh, set working D temp. They are not. It's not. Yeah, it's not here. It doesn't write it. It doesn't write it, but it says, it says everything is fine. Uh, let me see if I get some error message. Okay, let me do it like this. Also says it's all fine. Ah, here, now I got it. It was something with the R Studio. Don't worry. Uh, so uh, here is the map. And uh, let's uh, let's take a look at that map. And uh, we have to go now to Germany. We jump to Germany. And you see, we predicted this uh, soil type. And uh, the nice way to visualize this, it's uh, with some something like, uh, like this color is like a yellow to yellow to brown or something. And um, I go up to, yeah, up to 100, no, okay, up to 65% maybe. So from zero to 65. So, so here's the probability map, right? And, uh, and then, uh, well, uh, I could also, let me, okay. Maybe I made a mistake, I go to QGS. Uh, let's go to the, Let me go to the plot KML. And I can use the same legend I use here. Let's see. I think I can also use Zlim. Okay, so this is more interesting. So that's the same now. I look at the same prediction uh, of that soil type, but now I I, pre I put the prediction into uh, Google Earth, and this is usually nice because we can now take a look. How, how does it relate with the landscape? So, so I can play a bit and I can look at it. How does it relate to the landscape? Right? So here we predict the soil type probability distribution. And, and the other things we can add now, uh, we can add the training points. So we also do a plot KML of the training points, Ebergotzen, and I'm interested in the soil type. Let's take a look. So, so now you can see the, and you see there's a lot of points. You have to be careful, but uh, we can see that there's a relatively good match. It's a relatively good match. You see, this is the observed. This is the predicted. And there are some cases when there's a mismatch, like here. 
you know, there seems to be a mismatch, but otherwise everything which is this blue, this is this soil type, you see? So it looks like it like to be a good match. And uh, let's take a look at some other soil type. So if I look at the, the this legend, so let's pick up some other soil type, uh, like uh, maybe this gley. This only comes in a few few locations, so I have to turn this off. And uh, so this comes on less locations, and uh, you can see also there's a relatively good match. And they, this is an NA, so we don't worry about this. But uh, this is this gley, you see, gley, gley, gley. Mm -hmm. So it comes, it comes okay, and, and I see this gley. It's kind of it uh, comes in this uh, 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 like a valley or something. So these are the soils that come on the bit on this uh, hydrological co uh, uh, accumulation, which makes sense. You know, clay it means a clay soil, so <laughs> that that makes sense. It means that the uh, this yeah. So these are these soils which come in these uh, valleys. So heavy clay, probably clay so clay soils. And also here, there's a bit of the same. And because you see, it's also observed at three locations, I think, or something. Three. Yeah, here it's observed. So it uh, it really comes close to observations. Do you agree with me? It really the machine learning. You know, if you have a lot of data, it really comes close to uh, observations. It really it's like a kind of like a spatial interpolation, right? On the end. Mm -hmm. If uh, we we are seeing the probability map for each class, okay? Yeah, I have to open uh, each each class. I have to open as a separate uh, separate map. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this was one class, and this is the other class. Uh, and uh, and then you can you can uh, you can see how much how how much is the difference and. And uh, you can see that some some classes you see it's very distinct when it's red. It's kind of distinct, and when it's in between yellow and red, it means it's like a transitional zone, transition, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you can see with these transitions where do they happen. Okay. And you can also plot the standard deviation of all, of all uh, probabilities. So this is standard deviation of probabilities, and as it gets uh, the blue, the blue means a high error, and a yellow it means low. And so you can see there are places where the error is a bit higher, and of course where you have a higher probability you, you get usually high errors and also transition zones this is the transition zones there they have a high errors here so uh, so that's the this is for the soil type mapping you can also use so use the same basically um, approach you do the you you basically you just say train spatial learner and you say ebergotsen instead of uh, muse and you say covariates and then here uh, the uh, SP learner recognized this is a factor type variable. So it's not numeric, it's factor. And because it's a factor variable, then it uh, fits the, it fits this classification, uh, classification learners. And in this case, you can use uh, neural nets to do classification. You can use the, the XGBoost and the random forest. So random forest can be used both for classification and, and uh, regression purposes. And so, so that's the that's for the using the machine learning also for for soil mapping, but mapping soil types. And as you see, it's a quite okay result, uh, considering that uh, I can turn off these points. Considering that you know you uh, we match okay with the observed points. So where we observe the uh, the some class, we can also predict it. There's also mismatch, like here we uh, have a different class. Uh, so there's also mismatches and it's not, soils are not simple, right? You know, so it's uh, not not going to be like 100% usually R square uh, or the accuracy or classification accuracy. So so I think this accuracy is maybe like 60% or something, 60% match in hard classes. And then if you want to uh, look at the uh, match in the probability space, then you would use a low gloss 
uh, log loss function. And, uh, and then it tells you how much the probabilities match. But this is this uh, soil mapping with the probabilities. And uh, as you see, you can do the map and you can jump in, the, in Google Earth and you can actually see, and you can even pick up some photographs if you find, and you can see uh, what type of trees you have, or maybe here there's a photo of nature. So you, you get the idea. And also what's very nice, you can of course look in 3D and you can zoom in and you can see uh, where, where, where in the landscape these uh, soil types come. Uh, so so that's, uh, that's about uh, ensemble machine learning. Tom. Yes. Is it possible to combine all these probability maps in order to get uh, uh, an only one soil class map? Yeah, the, the, the soil class map, it's actually it's here. That's a good question. It is in the predictions. Let me see. Uh, this is the most, pro so what you're asking is the most probable. Yes. Uh, yeah, let me just see. Um, so these are the probabilities. And now let me write here. I will, I can put also here. Uh, I just have to see what's the names. So if I look at the names. Uh, I ah no response response is the most probable response. Okay. So and now I can plot this, but I don't have the legend now. So I just I I'll just take a, some random legend, and this Z limb I don't need. Uh, so just like this. And now this is the most probable class, and you can see actually, you can okay. see the the names here, right? You can see the name. You have to define a threshold, a probability threshold. No, no, this one just takes the highest probability, just the highest. So, so if the highest probability is seventy percent, then it takes seventy. So it's just the highest, highest probability, most probable value, right? Okay. Yeah, and you can also, if you look at here now, let's say this class. I mean, we can see how well it matches. Uh, so. You know, so you can see this this class, which is like here, it's this. Uh, uh, I think it's this para brown area. I think. Is it at the class? So oh, wait, what was the second one we looked? So the second one was the one we wrote. Uh, brown area, brown area. It's kind of brown area. It's a brown soil, whatever. Um, so brown para brown area, brown area. So that's this class. I think it's the most frequent class, almost. Um, and you see it covers also we predict here, even though we don't have points here, and that's a bit scary, you know, we don't have any points here, but we predict like the model kind of extrapolates, you know? So it, it says, well, it's on this part of the hill, on this part here, you get uh, this class. And, and so what, why do you think, why this point so clustered? What do you think? What the question? What the points? They are very clustered. The points. Yeah, I I, I don't know, but I, I think that uh, maybe in in one pixel we have two points. That that's also possible. But my question is why we have here a lot of points and here no points. Why do you think? Vegetation. Yeah. Accessibility. Access. Uh... No, no, it's more trivial. This project, this data. It comes from agricultural soil mapping. So they were only interested in agricultural land. No. And, yes, and they never went in the, in the uh, forest. They have, but, but when you think there are some points, they do fall kind of in a forest. They, they look like they fall in the forest. But if you really zoom in, if you really zoom in, it will be rarely like this point. But even this point, I think it's there's some farm or something. Here is a farm. So, so none of the points actually falls in the forest. All the points are just agricultural land. So basically we make the prediction of soil types based on agricultural uh, survey, but we predict, we also predict all around. Yes. So you would say, well, okay, we do some extrapolation and 
and it's a question. I I would uh, I will be very careful to use these predictions for the. Oh yeah, here it's really in the forest. This one is okay. This one is really in the forest. So somehow they do have some points uh, like in the forest, but I will uh, I will question these predictions for the for the forest. I will really question it. Otherwise, for agricultural land, it's a quite okay accuracy and it works like a spatial interpolation because literally you have the predictions kind of go around the points. I mean, where you have the point, it will always try to, machine learning always tries to come close to the data. And so it works like uh, doing some spatial interpolation. So that's the, that's the thing with the soil types. And in, and in this tutorial, so I can stop with this. Uh, in this tutorial, um, and by, by the way, personally, I, I don't recommend using the hard classes only to visualize. If you want to make decisions, if you want to do further modeling, then I recommend using these things, probability classes, because you can set up a threshold and you can decide, you can say, well, I want anywhere where I have even 10% probability of some class, you know, I want to do some different management. Uh, because if you do the hard class, then you don't know that. You don't, have, you don't know that uh, resolution of probability. So I recommend that you for decisions and for further modeling that you use the probability maps only. Mm -hmm. So so that's the, that's the thing. But this was all about ensemble machine learning. Let me see if somebody has a questions. Um, quantile random forest. No, the quantile random forest is uh, for regression only. It's not, it's not easy to implement on the classification problems. You will have to basically switch to doing a binomial variable. Each class you will have to model as a binomial, but even then it's complicated. So it's not easy to uh, uh, apply quantile regression uh, forest. Yeah, because the quantile, quantile techniques, quantile regression techniques are for regression modeling. They're not for, uh, for the um, uh, classes, for um, factor type variables. Any other questions? Is it possible also that we we find the the pixels that has uh, maybe two probabilities, two high probabilities from two classes, and this no, is no, it's a impossible. Problem. No, it's impossible because probabil these probabilities they uh, they sum up to hundred percent. Ah, but they any, sum up to 100%, yes, okay. Yes. And any pixel you have the probability they sum up to 100%. So it's impossible. So also, you know, you could derive many other variables. You could de derive confusion index or this uh, entropy indices, you know, so it shows you, for example, if you have, if you have a one class at the pixel, it's like 99% and all the other classes are like uh, 1%, you know, that's a very pure prediction, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have a, if you have a three classes and they all have 30% probability, then it's a maximum confusion. It uh, means mm -hmm. it's 100% confusion. So entropy is like uh, very high. Uncertainty, entropy, whatever you want to call it, it's very high. Uh, so, okay. so you can do further analysis with probabilities. That's why I say people, you know, stop using hard classes. This is like very old fashioned and you, don't, you lose all the information, a lot of information, let's say, mm -hmm. 90% information you, you lose if you uh, work only with hard classes. Only if you really just want to visualize, just to see, okay, if I put this map, if I take this map, then I, then I know, okay, this is primarily, this is the highest values for this class, for that class. But uh, if you want to do further decisions or any modeling, then you should use this thing. And, uh, and this thing is the probability because the machine learning offers you that, so you have that gradient of uh, how strong is uh, some class uh, and you can set up then different thresholds you can say well i want to, to avoid any risk you say well let's say anywhere i have above 10 percent uh, chance of that class i want to apply this or everywhere i have a uh, more than 60 percent of that class i want to apply this and all these things you cannot do once you do hard classes so uh, but but this is this uh, ensemble machine learning as i said and this is, uh, I'm still doing just 2D, you know? I'm doing a 2D points and I'm doing a 2D uh, uh, numeric uh, variables and, and the classification variables. Um, okay, 
the MLR models. No, there's no uh, quantile, re quantile regression random forest as a package to run it. Uh, it's not available in the MLR, I think. So it's not available, but you can do it as a, you can probably plug it in somehow. But it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change as the random forest, how it's modeled. It doesn't, it doesn't improve accuracy. It just gives you option to do calculate the probabilities in the, for the uh, numeric variables. So you can calculate these confidence intervals, sorry, net probabilities, confidence intervals. So that was all about the, about the ensemble machine learning. And please uh, read that, uh, read the tutorial here. And also in the tutorial, you can see uh, there are some articles, uh, but I also do uh, like a uh, two scale modeling. So you can do also two scales, like the core scale model, the 250 meter. Um, and then you do the, the fine scale model, 100 meter. And, and then you can, this is a comparison, core scale, fine scale. So you do two models independently. So different covariates, you know, it's the same training points, but you have different covariates. And you do one, you do on a, on a core scale, 250, and the other you do on 100 meter. And, and then you do a, a merger, you merge them, you do a fusion. And, and this is the prediction, which is a combination of 100 meter and 250 meter. So it's another level of ensembling. So you now ensemble the scales. <laughs> and, uh, and then also you can do the errors, you can also merge. And there's a formula to do a pooled variance. So it's a kind of a variance of a, a combination of predictions. And that's also very interesting. So remember this thing here, if you, if you work with two scales, because you can speed up computing. If you do whole of Brazil, if you do whole of Brazil, you have a MODIS data, you have, I don't know, a proba V data, you have these uh, different layers and different resolution. And then people go, how do they work with this data? It's a multi-source data. And this is a solution. And, uh, and by the way, I can hear somebody talking. This is the solution. And we wrote this uh, also paper uh, doing that uh, uh, multi-scale machine learning for whole of Africa. So you can read about that uh, here. So we did that, we did two scales, the 250 and 30 meter, uh, and we mapped the uh, Africa at 30 meter. It's, you can imagine it was a long project and a lot of work. And, um, but I basically used these techniques that I showed you. Uh, I used the techniques to make the predictions. And uh, so that's the, that's the um, doing a multi-scale uh, merger. I don't, have you heard of this uh, uh, soil agronomy data cube for Africa? Have you heard about it? I, I didn't. Okay. So, yeah, so this is amazing work. Yeah, so Ooh, this okay. is 30 meter resolution. And you see it's really, really super fine resolution. And this is organic carbon. And anywhere you click, you can get the confidence intervals and you get an estimate. So that's a 0.8% organic carbon. And here it's a bit higher. I don't know. This is a 1.7%. Uh, but you see confident interval between 1.4 and 2.1. So the confidence interval is wide. I mean, we have still quite some uncertainty, but you can do topsoil and subsoil. Of course, subsoil has much less, it has much less uh, soil organic carbon, but you can also switch to like a, a pH. I don't know, this is the pH map. Uh, and if I zoom in somewhere, let's say zooming in, and then I can set up this uh, opacity, uh, but I have to put some satellite image, let me see. Oh, satellite image. So if I put opacity, then I can see uh, this pH, how detailed it is. It's really detail map. It's like 30 meter resolution. Um, and you can see that sometimes it's uh, really, it's correlated with the reflectances of the soil. So like here, you know, so it correlates. Yeah, but so it's very, it's very detailed. And also we, we mapped, uh, of course, the uh, soil nutrients. So we have the magnesium and uh, potassium, and I don't know. So you can also access all that. Uh, and you can see the every pixel. So uh, that, uh, is, which, which variables you, you use to, to do this map? Uh, so the, you mean the covariates, covariate layers, you mean? You mean covariates, right? Yes, yes, the covariates, yes. So you, can, you can read, I mean, I don't have time now, but 
If I, I, will, at, I will read. I will read yeah, it. If you, yeah, if you look here, there's somewhere uh, methods uh, and so uh, lots of covariates we have the we had about uh, two terabytes of uh, fine okay. resolution data. So that's all the Sentinel products we produced. We okay. produced our own, our own Sentinel products. And then also we had the modis probably uh, the terrain, uh, terrain parameters. We have all the climate layers, uh, precipitation, temperatures, everything. So it's a mixture of really all yeah, the soil forming factors. Big sets yeah. of that. Yeah, it's a lot of data. Okay. So almost okay. a three terabyte, yeah. three terabyte of input data. Okay. And this okay. is this multi multi scale modeling. You know, you do, for example, this was, this will be like a 250 meter. This is 30 meter, and then you sum up and you get this thing. So, uh, so that's that's what we did. But you can okay. read all about it. I send you the paper here. I, I, yeah, please put in the in the chat. Tom, uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, the combined answer for multi resolution, as you stated, it, 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 did it give a, a better result or were you just tackling the technical possibility of combining answers and, and assembling answers uh, in different scales? Uh, uh, so the, we absolutely, we couldn't do, uh, we couldn't do 30 meter resolution everything. So it was not even an option. It, it, it would have been just too, the data size would have been too high. Uh, so we first, we started doing it as a technical solution so we can make the predictions. Um, but I, 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 I can tell from the variable importance, you know, for many variables, we have the actually the coarse resolution variables that are more important than the fine resolution variable. So, so once we did, uh, I think I have here some variable importance. Uh, so if you look, this is like a really variable important, but all variable. So it's a bit difficult to read, but um, you can see that the, the depth, the, the bottom is the most important variables. So you, we get, sometimes we have a climate and sometimes it's uh, Chelsea climate, bioclimate. And then sometimes we get the, uh, uh, the Sentinel data is being important. So, uh, so it depends on the variable, but in, in, in average, it's a mixture, you know? So absolutely the core covariates are needed. So we use them and they're needed. We have a proof that uh, important, especially for chemical soil properties. Um, so, uh, so in a way that already justifies to use all the data, but whether we, if we have just downscale everything to 30 meter, like if we had maybe, you know, 350 layers. So if you, if I take, the 90 layers, they were 30 meter and they take two terabytes. So if I have to downscale another, another um, 300 layers or 250 layers to 30 meter, then it blows up, you know, it's just the data size becomes so big that uh, we, we probably wouldn't have been able to finish or uh, to, you know, even the, to have a technical capacity to compute. So that's why we had to do, we have to do that uh, multi-scale. And, um, and it, you know, it's not, I mean, if you look also here, the example I showed you, you see this thing here. I mean, this is classical example. You could take this data set and you could test, for example, what, what if I, I, if I use this approach or if I just use the hundred meter and most likely we'll see, you see there's quite a difference in prediction also, right? It's very interesting. This is really school example, right? So you, you can see there's a difference in prediction independent models they're different, and again, it's ensemb through ensembling. Most likely, you see this red red zone. So you, the one model predicts a higher values here; the other doesn't. So most likely, ensemble will predict here. In, and if you look at the predictions, so ensemble predicts here a bit reddish, right? And I think you will miss that if you haven't used the 250 meter. So so that's a kind of a proof that uh, yes, if you do this ensembling also of multiple scales, it helps. I mean, you are, as you add more data, if data is correlated, you add, uh, you uh, help improve accuracy, mapping accuracy. So, uh, so my, uh, my answer is probably you should consider doing that multi-scale, how many scales you want to do. Like here, I mean, I make a plot just to, uh, just, uh, just to explain the theory. And here, I think it's with the uh, four scales. So you can do four scales. So how many scales you should do, I don't know. I think for practical purposes, two is good enough. 
two scales, you know, for many soil mapping project will be good enough. You get 250 and 30 meter or 250 and 100 meter. And I think it's good enough to, uh, to estimate what is the, to, to, uh, to get that uh, different scales and speed up computing. Uh, we speed up our computing for Africa. My estimate is that we speed up by, uh, without losing on accuracy, uh, we speed up maybe 10 times. So okay. 10 times we speed up because we use this multi-scale model. Okay, so mm -hmm. this is all about the uh, ensemble machine learning. Now I switch to the to the next topic, which is the uh, the space time. Okay. okay, and so let me do that uh, for another half an hour, and then we can still have some time for questions. So the space time you can also clone. You can clone that. Uh, so here is the. So let me first send you. I will send you the the URL. It's also in that Google Doc I sent you. Uh, so here's the URL. So I will now explain a bit the space time. And it's also just a, a, it's a tutorial that I can clone. I already cloned it, so I, I will just open it here. Um, so I have it here. So that's this tutorial and this is now in space time. Uh, so I'll just to first explain a bit about space time. So when you do the, the 2D modeling or 3D modeling, you know, there's no problem. There's no problem about time. When you do space time, then imagine the space time data. Um, so like, let's say, let's say this is the meteorology. Um, and you see when you can plot the space time data, you, you know, you can plot it through as animation, but you could also plot it in a space time cube. So you can see that the time is, you imagine it like a third dimension. So, so the time is a third dimension and imagine we always plot it going up because you, know, you cannot travel to, to past. So the direction it's all only going up. And so as you do the new measurements, you just go, you move in the time this, this way. And then you have, the, you have the spatial support but you have also temporal support. And that's whether you aggregate like hourly data, daily data, monthly data, so this is all temporal support and spatial support is when you do 30 meter, 100 meter, 250 meter. Uh, and then when you look at the, the temporal uh, component, uh, so, so the temporal dimension, then you see that, yeah, you have, for example, seasonality, uh, you have some also temporal trends, you know? So usually they say there's these three components uh, of any temporal data. So that's the, the trend, the seasonality, and the random component. And so you have to consider all that when you do the modeling. And, uh, and this is the soil data, for example, this is now soil data. That's this paper that I shared from, from Kaylee Gesh um, and me and other people, we, we wrote this paper together and we, uh, we consider three variables, the soil salinity, water content, temperature, and also we consider it through depth. So you could see how this variable changes with depth. So temperature, you know, it's a, it's a, as you go deeper, there's less oscillation of temperature and the soil water content is more, a bit more chaotic and you have the dry seasons and wet seasons. They're kind of the same every year, the dry season, wet season, but uh, you can see that uh, some years you can, it can be a bit wetter and some years can be a bit drier. So, but also if you go deeper to the soil, then this uh, wet and dry also, it's kind of becomes more stable it's more stable. Mm -hmm. And so this is this uh, space time data. And then uh, what, we, what we tend to now use is this uh, geometric component of temperature. Uh, so that's something also I explained, maybe I don't have time now to go into detail, but you could, exp you could uh, kind of map the, the minimum and maximum temperature, which is only due to the position of the sun. So due to the latitude and angle, uh, and that's the formula here. Uh, so without going into that, if you take any, any, uh, any latitude, phi is the latitude, and this is the day of the year, uh, you can predict what is the temperature anywhere in the planet, right? Uh, you don't need to know uh, anything else, just the uh, phi and the temperature, and maybe elevation you can uh, plug in. And also if you take here five years, for example, this is five years, I could plot it and I could see the, the temperature. So we can, we can test that just very quickly. Let's test it for your location in Brazil. 
just if you tell me the latitude, uh, just tell me, please, the la your latitude, and I will uh, test that. 25 uh, of uh, west. So I will put uh, latitude. So um, not not the not the uh, uh, longitude. Latitude, please. The latitude. Yes. Maybe twenty-four degrees. So you are in the, you are in the southern hemisphere. Yes, it's a minus. Minus twenty-five. Yes. Minus twenty-five. So you see, I can predict now uh, which day is today. Uh, from the beginning Dave, of the three hundred and thirty. So <laughs> so let, let me let me do like this format and i say is date and today is a 2021 uh what is it 27 27 of, uh, 11. yeah 27 and i format it to uh day of the year so let me just see So today it's the which day of the year 331 and you on the latitude uh, minus 25 so let's take a look it says the temperature will be 25 25.1 and that's the the minimum temperature i think minimum which one is it hello you still hear me yes yes we hear you yes. okay. So, so this is the this is the temperature, and I can put also elevation. Which elevation are you now? In the surface, in the soil surface. Yes, the your elevation where you are now. So let's say it's a two hundred meter. I don't know. Right. So you see, it's a bit it's a bit less, and I could now go and and plot that also. So um, so I take this thing. P minus 25, and I could also plot it for the whole year. Let me see if this is correct. Uh, so I get something like this. So at the beginning of the year, you have the higher temperatures and then it drops to 14 degrees. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, you see, I, I could map that without without uh, uh, having any map, any climatic data. It's just based on this formula. And, uh, and this is my PhD student, Milan Kilibarda, he derived it. So he spent quite some time to fine tune that. And, uh, and he made this, basically you have to estimate these parameters, A and B. Uh, and you can then also do different, with a different A, B, you can get different, uh, whether it's a minimum, maximum mean. And so, so with this thing, you can basically quantify the, you can quantify the, uh, the temperature and, and also what it means, you can model the seasonality. You see, this is the seasonality. So now if I have a space-time data and if I'm mapping like monthly, cha monthly changes or daily changes uh, in, for example, soil moisture, or I don't know, then I could plug in this uh, geometric, uh, geometric component. I can plug it in. Right, uh, and that's what they do here in this uh, in this system of the the mapping. Let me see. So if you look at the, and this is the example with the with the Cook Farm data set. So Cook Farm data set. So let's go to that one here. So here's the Cook Farm, and again, I uh, this data set is in my landmap package. Um, and if you load the data, you see, uh, let me first do this just a second. I cleaned the session, so let's see this. So here's the data set and, and you see it's just a one object, but it has multiple elements. So it has, these are the original readings and look, there's 30,000 readings. So these are the readings, uh, I think on a, I think it's a daily basis. So the, yeah, the daily readings. And you, you see the port, uh, port one, it's the first layer surface. So I think it's a zero to 30 or, or zero to 10, zero to 10. And then the second layer, third layer, fourth layer. And these are the three variables. So you have the uh, 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 soil moisture, VW, C, temperature, and EC is the conductivity. So the three variables. Uh, and then you have second on the list is the soil profiles. So we all have a soil profile data. It's about 
1050 uh, uh, layers uh, because the multiple layers and then you have um, here uh, this thing it's the the grids so you can see the grids so so we could for example just plot one grid let me do that so plot And uh, let's plot the TVI. Um, oh yeah, now it's uh, just uh, I plotted it, but it's not uh, it's not yet uh, um, it's not converted into a grid. It's just a table. Um, and then we have the weather data. This is cl from climatic station. Also daily values of precipitation, minimum, maximum temperature. So we have all this data, um, and then. So now we're going to do some space-time modeling. So um, we will load now, you know, to do a space-time overlay, it's a bit complicated. I don't have time to explain it. So what I do, I, I created using this data, I created already a space-time overlay. Um, and so I, and I prepared it and I load it and also the grids. And now these grids, I can plot. This is stuff I wanted to plot, cook farm grid and let's plot TVI. So, so here's the topographic wetness index, right? So that's an area in the US, it's in the Washington state. And this is topographic wetness index. And again, we can do it, uh, we can plot it in. Uh, we can plot it in Google Earth, let me do that. So I just switched to plot KML and uh, let's take a look. So we, we jump into US. So here's that uh, little area. Uh, it's not a big area, but you know, they have so much data for this farm. They prepared so much data. So, uh, so we're very happy that we could uh, do all this modeling because they had, they actually had, I think about 10, 12 years of measurements, daily measurements of soil properties. And so it's a uh, and, and different depths. They put up this automated uh, sensor network and they put all these uh, measurements there. And you can read all about it in the paper, of course. Uh, that's the paper I sent you. The let me see. Uh, this paper I've sent on the uh, that you can download. Uh, this uh, this paper. So if you read in this paper, so these are these uh, 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 stations the triangles are stations and they're automated sensor networks. So they're put in the soil and they're buried in the soil basically. And they send the, they send the readings every day or actually every hour, I think they do readings. And then these are the black ones are the soil profiles. And then they send this data and then uh, the data looks like this. Uh, and this is just the one station. I think we just plot the one station, but you have a 45 stations. And, and these are the dis density distribution also for the whole data. And so, so here's the data. And uh, so what we want to do is we want to fit a space-time model using ensemble machine learning. Yeah, so simple as that. Uh, and I already prepared, a, I did a space-time overlay. So this RM, RM usually I use it for regression matrix. So this is the RM. And basically when I look at this RM, Let's take a look. Uh, I will open it here. It's a it's a large object, even though it's a small area. That's the thing with when you switch to space time, uh, get ready get ready for really big data. So let's take a look at that. So we have the this is the ID of the point. So that's a unique location ID. This is the measurement of the target variable soil moisture. Uh, this is the easting northing altitude. Uh, which is the depth. So if it's minus, minus 0 0.3, it means it's 0 0.3 meter be below soil, minus 0 0.5 meter. Uh, and then you have all these other variables and you see some variables, they change, uh, through, they change through time. And some variables are like fixed. They're fixed because for example, elevation, DEM or topographic wetness index, they're always the same. There's no, there's no difference. But for example, the date, the date changes and then with the date, you have a different temperatures, different rainfall. So as you go to different days, then you see the changes. So it, it becomes a space time. It's a space time regression matrix, right? 
And now what do we do? We, we fit a model. Here we fit a model where uh, we say that the, the soil moisture is a function of the elevation, uh, sorry, the depth, the depth elevation, topographic lattice index. Uh, this is normalized difference uh, index something. Uh, then precipitation, maximum minimum temperature and the time of the day. So we say this is, and this one is the crop rotation, I think. So we say these are the variables that uh, possibly explain the soil moisture. Yes. And now we can go and we just fit, we just fit a model. So, uh, uh, and, and poof, we get, again, it will be parallelized. You see it runs in parallel goes. And poof, we get the model. Here's the random forest model uh, that explains the basically uh, soil moisture. And it uh, R square is 0 0.85. So let's say relatively high. And you see, I have a uh, 100,000 sampling points because it's a space time. You know, when you look at the data mm -hmm. set, when you look at the data set here, it's, uh, it's only 45 uh, points, but you have 45 points, four depths, I think. Uh, and then you have, is it four depths? Wait, yeah, four depths. And then you have uh, uh, daily measurements for like two or three years. And so if you multiply 45 by five by 365, you get, you get to the lot of points, you get to 100,000 points easily, right? So we fitted that model and we say, okay, this is great. We have this model 0 0.85, but in the paper we discovered that we actually, we overfitted. We overfitted the model because, um, because the, the, the ra uh, random forest, if it has a duplicate location, so the uh, soils, you know, you have often, you know, same properties, but then you, you have just different depths. Uh, then we notice that the random forest will overfit. Somehow it kind of recognizes the feature space of the SAMS uh, station, and then it's much easier to predict. And, and then it overfits. So this uh, 0 0.85, it's not realistic. It's not realistic. So what we have to do, we have to take the whole stations. So we have to use the source ID to take the whole complete stations out of the validation. That's all explained in this paper by Roberts also, Roberts 2017. You can read all about this uh, thing uh, here in this uh, Roberts paper. Uh, so please read about this. It explains how you should do cross validation when you have, um, um, you know, temporal spatial hierarchical or phylogenetic structure data. So how you have to uh, subset to do cross validation. Um, and so that's what we now do here. We go here and we say, okay, now we want to fit uh, machine learning and, but we want to use a blocking parameter. You see this blocking. Yes, so we use a blocking parameter, yes. which is going to be the source ID. So it we will take the whole stations out. So when we do the machine learning, the ensemble machine learning with Ranger, Gun Boost, and I don't know, we will take the whole, so let's do that. Uh, we will take the whole stations out. And, uh, and just because it's a two computational, we subset to 5%. Uh, I could subset maybe to uh, 1%, I don't know. 10% uh, sorry. And now let me do that. Uh, so uh, this is the task. And now we can we can train it. And I run it in parallel again. And so we see it's, it's running now in parallel. So now I'm training it. I'm training it uh, ensemble machine learning. So not only the a ranger, but I take three models and I take the whole station stations out when I do the training. Yes, and I make now the ensemble estimate of the soil moisture using the proper uh, cro uh, cross validation uh, strategy to uh, avoid overfitting. And so let's take a look at that, and um, and then we we'll look at the we'll compare the model so. Now, this is the, I'm training learner by, le by learner, you know? So, um, and, and now it's done. So we have a model, so very exciting. We have a space-time soil model. 
Uh, I don't know if you ever fitted it in your life, but if you fit it here, you, you feel at least, okay, I did it. I, I can fit the space-time soil models. Um, and let's take a look at the model. You see now the model is uh, 44%. Yeah. So zero, yeah, so R squared is much, it's much smaller R squared. Uh, you see now the all the learners are important and they're equal almost, uh, this one is a bit more important ranger. Um, but uh, they are still important. All three learners, the gum boost and the uh, lasso, they're all important. But you see the R square is much smaller. It's a 0 0.44. And you remember we had the R square of 0 0.85 here, right? So that's not the realistic R square. That's overfitting basically. That's R square of if you will uh, overfit the data. And this one is the more, more realistic. And then we can do a prediction. And now to predict, we have to prepare the data for prediction. So we have to prepare, we have to create what is called a slice. So we have to create a slice. And, um, and so basically we, we I have to specify the date and I have to specify the depth at which I want to predict, right? And now I have this uh, data frame, um, which has, let's see, I show you this. So uh, this data frame looks like this. So I have all the covariates. I have all the covariates and I have the um, exactly the date at which I predict and cumulative date. Yes, and I also have the depth of the soil. So I have all this thing defined and now I can do a prediction. And this prediction goes fast, that's uh, nothing uh, special. And now I can also do a plot. So let me do the plot. And so here's the plot. Here's a plot of this uh, uh, predicted soil moisture exactly on that day and exactly at the depth of uh, 30 uh, centimeter, uh, sorry, uh, uh, minus 0 0.3 meter or 30 centimeter. Uh, and I could also do it something like this, paste. So let's put this, uh, I think I call it somewhere depth or something. Yeah, depth. So I could also do it like this. So that's the that's the plot. Now let's take another. We take another prediction. We say we want to predict at the zero point six. Right. Uh, and let me plot this. I will plot this here so that I don't lose it. I plot it here. And I will put the points. So I see this is the, 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 the station data. Now I say I want to predict the 0 0.6. So uh, nothing special, I just copy these things. And then I predict. And then again, I can plot. And now it's a second plot. Oops, here. So now we have two plots, uh, except I lost the other plot. But uh, so one was the, on the 60 centimeter and one was on 30 centimeter. Okay. Uh, maybe I should call it, I should call it here uh, one or two or something because uh, now I rewrote it. But you can see that there's a difference in the, in the plots. Unfortunately, it turns out that when I uh, do something here, I lose the plot, I lose completely. No, let me do it one more time, wait. I will call it, a, I will call it a, 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 this one like this. And then, and then this one I'll, I will call, I will redo with a 30 centimeter. So this one I will call number one. Okay, and then we could also plot them next to each other. Let me see. So this was the one and two, right? Um, yeah. 
Okay. Ah, plot raster. I have to do SP plot. Uh, just a second. I'm getting there. SP plot. Uh, this one, main axis box. Yes. So you see uh, this, can you still see my screen? Yes, Tom. Yes. Yeah, so you see I made the predictions for two depths and you see that they're different values. I mean, they're on the same scale now, same legend. And you see that the values differ to depth. And I can see, for example, that the surface soil, uh, in this case, which one was the, the surface one was the, the, the one, I think. Uh, so the surface moisture, it's a bit less than the bit deeper. So the, the, the looks like that on that day, the, the moisture drained, it went through the soil. And I know there's a BT horizon, by the way, here. I know they have a BT horizon. So if I predict now at 1.5 meter, let's say I go to 1.5 meter and let me add it uh, as, a, as a plot. I will add it as the third one. Um, let me see where was it, SP plot. So now I add the third one. It's a nail. Ah, no, sorry, here, I forgot, I copied a bit too, too much. Okay. Ah, sorry, this one. I copied a bit too much. Oh, no, no, actually. It's it extra correct. bracket, yeah, I guess. It's yeah, it was correct. And let's see now. Ah, it's also this plus here because I copy from the code. So now you see, uh, I plot it here, yeah, so you can see. <coughs> so now you have the, the tree depth and looks like as you go deeper, the, 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 so the moisture accumulates actually deeper, right? So it looks like as you go deeper, the, the soil moisture is uh, higher. In this case, for that day, you know, maybe some other day would have been different. Maybe if I compute now next day, it would have been maybe a bit different. But, uh, but this is a proof of concept that you can use ensemble machine learning uh, to do space-time prediction for daily values of soil moisture. You know, uh, you could also predict some, some things, monthly values, annual values. So it, the, for sure this framework, it's, uh, you can use it to do uh, space-time modeling. The only thing we discovered, that's a big thing we discovered is this overfitting effects and that's why we use this, uh, we, when we do this training, you see we use the, the blocking parameter, which in this case is the whole station data. So, uh, so that's this thing here. Uh, uh, this, uh, this thing, we, we take the whole station south. So we don't, we don't let the uh, model predict inside the stations to do any cross validation inside the stations, but we take the whole station south and I think that's more realistic. It gives a more realistic estimate of the actual mapping error. Uh, and that allows you then to also do a properly, more properly ensembling. Uh, and, and as you see, when we do ensembling, then the ranger, actually, I think you notice that, that the ranger, it's important, but it's not as important as here. So it's a much, much uh, on the end, much less important. And it's equally important even to some linear model like the lasso. So this is a, CVGLM net, so that's a combination of uh, a neural network on a, a fine tuning a, a linear model. Um, so yes, that's the that's the space time uh, space time machine learning, and you see also you can run it using uh, ensemble machine learning using MLR package, and you can predict multiple dates, multiple depths. So you do a proper, complete uh, four dimensional uh, prediction. And, and with yes. this thing, actually, actually, I stop. I mean, 
you know, you could, uh, you can uh, play with that data set. And there's also in here, this example, there's also some other space time data sets. They're not soil science, uh, but uh, this one is from, for example, for uh, meteorology. So these are daily temperatures. And I also use uh, images. I use the uh, MODIS images, MODIS lens surface temperature. And we also predict daily values. And here also there's a code to do space time overlay. So to do space time overlay, you have to match the points and the rasters in a space time cube. Um, and you can also run it in parallel here to speed up because as you notice, when you do a space time data, it's really usually, you see here, there's like a 50,000 points for the soil moisture. We had like 100,000 points. So that's serious number of points. You know, you, you really have to parallelize because otherwise you will like wait for days or something. Um, and, um, and so then you add also this geometric temperature. You see, this is this geometric temperature I showed you. And this model is a bit more simple. You have the, so the surface, temperature measured at station is function of geometric temperature, modest land surface temperature, daytime, nighttime, and then distance to the sea. And again, we fit a, a model with blocking. Again, we use the blocking parameter, which is the uh, station ID. Uh, and then we get a model. And you see this model is more significant. R square is 0 0.88. Uh, and then you can uh, see that in variable importance, the geometric temperature it's actually very important. It already helps you. Uh, and it looks like the nighttime, modest temperature, nighttime, it's more important for daily surface temperature. Uh, so ab above ground temperature than the modest land surface temperature daytime. Uh, and then we get these uh, uh, predictions. And you see, you can, you can plot that predictions in uh, uh, like a time series of data. And you can see this is like a few days of predictions. And so you see that you can see changes in temperature uh, interpolated using space time ensemble machine learning and using also the seasonality models of the of this geometric formula, etc. So it's all kind of integrated in ensemble machine learning. Um, and so that's uh, that's it for me. Uh, I'm open out. Uh, you can still ask me questions. I'm open for questions, comments. Uh, I would like to hear from you. I mean, is it something, this is something really new, you know, are you really like seeing this for the first time or have you ever worked with space-time models and this uh, modeling seasonality and things like that? So please ask me questions. I will still be here for next uh, five to 10 minutes. Um, so please ask me questions. Well, I, I will open to the students if they want to ask something. You can open the microphone and talk. Or interact by chat, and then we can translate. Also. Anyone? Um, I have a talk. comment at all. It was fantastic. It is a space time modeling. It's very new for us. We wish to have all this database available, né, Valdir? <laughs> yes, yes. Our um, models, like uh, 10 years of measure, uh, measures uh, about soil and temperature and stations. This is kind of rare in Brazil. We have this kind of um, database available. And I think your, your course, uh, short course, but bring uh, a lot of novelty regarding modeling for us, at least for me. And I also like it, the, the approach to use probability classes instead hard classes. It also can aid to understand better the composition of soil mapping units regarding purity uh, of these units, kind of, which kind of classes can occur in each pixel. So I'm very happy and glad for your uh, your introduction, your course, and then uh, we open if any students want to make some additional questions. But thank you so much to be with us. Oh, well, by the way, you have enough in Brazil. I mean, whole of Brazil, you will have enough data to do space time modeling. You know, you have you have uh, enough data. It will be on the edge. I mean, um, it will be a bit on the edge because. Um, 
there will be huge gaps for some years, especially if you go if you go back in the past. Uh, yeah. Then you will have a more and more gaps, uh, but but it's uh, definitely it's possible, um, and I've been looking at this uh, uh, data sets. I have a, actually an open book. Uh, I will sh I will send you. So I've been looking at the the data set across the world, um, and I, I know for Brazil. I mean, I show you now. You, if you go for Brazil, you can find how much data you have, and also through space time, how does it uh, cover space time? But you could. You could do space time to like map uh, organic carbon or some chemical soap properties, how they change like a span of like a 30 years. You could do space time, uh, but okay. there will be some gaps. I will show you for US. If I if I look at the US, uh, this is the US data. Let me see. Uh, it's in my book. And I yes. do that in my in my book. I do a space time. Uh, so uh, and it's on the actually on soil carbon. And so you see here, there's the uh, deriving solar organic carbon in special thermal waters. This is the US data, and they this is the distribution of points through time. So they have about 50,000 points available, high quality laboratory data. And you see, they, they you know, they cover the, you know, maybe uh, 40, 50 years, and then it starts dropping. I mean, from 1950, it's less and less. Uh, but it covers it uh, covers space time, and, and we did that. We, we map here the carbon content. You see, this is the for the 2014, and this is 1925. So we could go to 1925 and map the carbon. So I, I think same time we could do it also for Brazil probably, but it would have been a bit a uh, bit uh, long shot, let's say. It would yes. have been a long shot. We ha we have another important <clears throat> variable for the carbon. That's the date of the the soil soil sample. Okay. <clears throat> And two things. I think that was very important what you show us about the the overfitting of the model when you use the ID of the station to 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 oh. choose about uh, between uh, trend and test. Okay, and uh, it's very important for us in the in the in the model spatial temporal model. It's very important. And in the chat, uh, uh, Tom, we have uh, three three questions. Could you see? Uh, Just uh, to tell you, th this is the difference between you see this thing here. Uh, this is uh, random forest, random forest, and this one is when you do stations out. It's a huge difference, right? Yes. Huge difference. So you have to be very careful. This is overfitting. This is all like you overfit. Yes. And this it's is something with uh, Alexander Vado, you know, in his talk, he also has these faces of people. He also took my face, you know, mm -hmm. he's a funny guy, he's a funny guy. Uh, so he took also my faces, all these people's faces, and he overfitted with random forest. And, and then he showed a map where you actually has a mixture of faces. And, and it's also nonsensical. But, so, but if you do a proper learning, like the way I do it now here, and I showed you, then you don't overfit, you know, you will, you will not see anybody's face, you know, it's a, it will be very difficult. So this is the proper training with uh, taking the whole stations out. Yes, yes, uh, it's very important. Yes, absolutely. But please question, there's something in the chat? In the chat, yes. From there's Jean a Fernandes. model being tested for soils with different structure and particle size distribution of soil that so if you think if you think there's a variable, for example, you call it uh, um, soil structure or particle size. I mean, particle size. You mean clay or sand content. Um, so so you say, okay, well, what if these things change? And if you want to model this model, I made for the the soil uh, uh, the uh, soil moisture, right? So so what you what I would recommend then doing just adding this in the formula here, so you can add the clay content. Yeah, you add the clay content or I don't know, some structure class, you add it and then you model with this and then it, the model will tell you how much it uh, differs. So that, that would be my answer to you. If you want to add that, uh, if you want to see how does it work, then just add it, add it in the modeling and then you will know. The, that's the whole essence of data science. You know, data, I don't, do you know this famous paper from Leo Breiman, the two cultures? Leo Brahim and two cultures. Have you ever heard of it? Okay. Yeah, no, 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 I have not. Uh, Leo Brahim and two cultures. 
it's a really it's a classic it's a um, uh, basically everybody who wants to get into uh, machine learning should read that uh, and it goes like this he um, he explains it that you know the traditional maybe a bit tradi more traditional statisticians they are quite they're quite uh, focused on models you know they they are the uh, beauty of your work is to find like the most simple model and something that you can mathematically prove and that you can derive and that's kind of like all these traditional statistics you probably learn at school and then you have this other culture which is kind of popping up now and this is the data science culture that you uh, you you basically build up a very flexible algorithms very generic algorithms the generic as you can imagine and then you just let the data tell you the structures so you don't you don't obsess with the models with this you know like if you look at the statistics you know you can have a glm and glm can have a different link function you can have different properties or or you can have some a combination of models and uh, so these are all like this thinking about models and then in the machine learning you know in data science culture it's it's just the data is the religion whatever Whatever matches the data, you use algorithms that match the data. <clears throat> so anyway, this is uh, something I recommend reading if you if you're interested in machine learning. This is a classic to start into getting into machine learning. Uh, Leo Breiman, and this one is actually also has a reply. People complain about what he said, and you know some people took it a bit uh, uh, emotional, let's say. Uh, but uh, so, but I, I agree with this Leo Breiman. Leo Breiman is the guy who made the random forest algorithm, by the way. Yeah, the pack, the package is right. No, not the package. He made, he invented the random forest, and then some other people put it in the in the package. Oh, okay. I think maybe also he programs in R. I'm not sure, but I think if you go to, for example, Ranger package. Um, Ranger package, it's uh, the most efficient way to use, uh, I recommend it, uh, uh, it's the C++ implementation of Random Forest, so it, it's a suitable for large data, it automatically parallelizes, um, and uh, made by Marvin Wright, uh, who, with whom I also collaborate, we write publications together. Um, so if you look at this one, uh, then it, it will mention also Leo Breiman somewhere, I think, you know, if you go to um, to the, the package, uh, I don't know, then you will uh, find, uh, let me see. Yeah, you see it referenced these papers from uh, Leo Breiman 2001, that's the first time that it's been uh, defined. So uh, so Leo Breiman is the guy who basically invented the random forest. Um, yes. and, then, and then he wrote this paper to cultures. And so I recommend that you, I highly recommend it's a, a, a let's say, it's a must read uh, for anybody who wants to get into machine learning. Yes, I usually use the REF package, but I will try to use the version. Tom, uh, I, I might be making some confusion here, but now I'm dealing with a Bayesian statistic for some inference. How this Bayesian approach has been used in, this, in these models, uh, I couldn't actually grasp how they fit in. Uh, are they- I, I, uh, I, think, I think you can plug it in in the ensembling. I mean, uh, if you have some Bayesian, let's see, regression. So there's a Bayesian Gaussian processes, I don't know. So you, you, I, if it's available here, you know, then it becomes just one of the learners, and maybe oh, yeah. it's so the best way. Yeah, but maybe it's the best way. But is, I, as in far as I understand, if I understand correctly, Bayesian, I, I haven't done much of Bayesian uh, modeling, but if I understand the power of Bayesian models uh, kicks in, if you have a, a data, for example, input data, point data, which have a variable uncertainty, or you have some prior distributions, and they are different, you know, then, then it, then it, uh, you know, uh, then it has an effect, positive effect. But if you don't have that information, I'm not sure. I, I think, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. But then it just converges to basically some linear model, like, like a BLM Bayesian linear model. Maybe if you don't have the prior, so if they're not different, then it maybe converges to uh, something more simple. But you can plug it into the as a, as a, if, as long as it's available here. Nice, thanks. Yeah, let me sell.
Até obrigado, mais. obrigado. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau. Nos vemos em breve, então, Valdir. Já, já. Pode deixar.